I have a lot of faith in people from Appalachia. It is an incredible place to grow up. It's an incredible place to, to raise children. Uh, people know their neighbors. They support one another. Uh, it's just the kind of place that you want to be. You want to spend your, your life and your career. And it's a place that people get along. They collaborate. We're proud to be the smallest independent city in Commonwealth Virginia, and where Virginia is the only state to practice independent city status, that we're also the smallest city in the country, and we're, we're proud of that. Here in, in Wise County, in the city of Norton, we all share this one outdoor recreation asset, and that's High Knob. It's this large landmass that's right here at the base of the city. We're developing mountain bike trails, uh, a whole system. We have about 11 miles. Our goal is to get it to 30 miles. But to us, we appreciate our outdoor recreation opportunities and our outdoor assets, but we're trying to connect them to our downtown, to our business community. So not only is it an opportunity for people to come in and uh, experience that, but also an opportunity to help our local economy. In St. Paul, we are trying to reinvent ourselves. We have historically been a coal and railroad community. We are changing our focus to outdoor recreation and tourism and a high quality of life for the residents. The Clinch River, of course, is one of the most biodiverse rivers in North America. It has always been here and we've never taken advantage of it like we are now. Uh, it's not well known throughout the Commonwealth, much less the country. It's small, but it does have a lot to offer. It has different levels of kayaking and canoeing ability from flat water all the way up to rapids in the lower part. We haven't respected it enough in past years because there was a lot of pollution and we have different agencies, especially Kirby, trying to reinvent how the river should be taken care of. And so right now here in St. Paul, we have three outfitters that take advantage of that. Giles County is a beautiful place, 37 miles of the New River, and 63 miles of the Appalachian Trail run through our county. It is a place that started, quite frankly, as a blue collar community and, and still is. While industry has changed and it looks different than it did 50 years ago, it's a great place to, to raise children. It's a great place uh, for kids to grow up, really kind of a fairy tale place. We have these all these incredible natural assets and, and natural resources. Outdoor assets are really important. You really can't have the services that create the quality of life that retains talent and that attracts talent and that attracts business unless you have these services. But the services can't really exist unless you have enough people. So and much of Appalachia is that way where you have a rural community and without tourists there to help support those businesses, we see that as just another aspect, as another piece of the puzzle of economic development because people can choose to live anywhere today. Industries can locate where they want. If you don't have a quality of life, you're not going to have the industry that you're really looking for. Thirty or forty years ago, people were always on the mountain, on the trails, hunting, fishing. But we had a couple of generations where that kind of stopped. Now we're seeing the younger generations be reintroduced, it's, it's really wonderful to see that tradition of interest. We have made a lot of progress in the last 20 years. We were a booming town in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and people had money when we had Four Lane Highway. We could get out of town, and go someplace else to spend our money, and that was hard on downtown businesses. But now we see that living downtown, being downtown, is really important for our community. The ARC's Power Initiative was established to help uh, local governments deal with the loss of coal-fired power plants and, and the coal industry in general. For 200 years, all of that brought jobs and brought money. It was a huge, huge part of our economy. 
You know, when we started experiencing the downturn in the coal economy, it was a gut punch, and we all had to step back and, and reevaluate, you know, where were we gonna go? You have an agency like DHCD that steps in and are there to help. Their agency, along with the Appalachian Regional Commission, I, I just don't know where we would be without the support that we've received. And it's it's not all funding, it's just, it's just the opportunity for people to come in and understand what your problems are and bring resources that help support what your goals and objectives are. This particular hotel, Western Front Hotel, did have some ARC funding. We also have the Historic Lyric Theater, which is in revitalization process right now, has also had ARC funding, and that is very important to the town. And this project will add a lot to St. Paul, not only entertainment. Spearhead, of course, with ARC funding, they've been able to do trail maintenance, hire rangers, expand their trails, and that's important because that indirectly affects things in St. Paul. I'm really excited about Appalachia's future because of the people. They're honest, they're hardworking, they know how to do things with their hands, they know how to solve problems. They're gritty by nature, but they care about their neighbors, they care about people in their community, and they care about community. We have people who want to make a great quality of life, it to be different from a fast-paced life. We have people here who want to work, want to make it the best they can. We have plenty of assets here in nature, outdoor opportunities for recreation, beauty, things that you can find here that you can't find anyplace else. It's truly a great feeling to see positive change and to introduce people to things that they have never been introduced to. And hopefully they're gonna develop their own love for the mountain, just like many of the other people that live here. And that'll be something that stays with them for the rest of their life. Morning. And thank you for joining us for this conversation about preserving and promoting Appalachian regions, nature, and culture. I'm Molly Theobald with the Appalachian Regional Commission. As our federal co chair, Gail Manchin, mentioned in this morning's plenary, ARC prioritizes building the region's culture and tourism as one of the Commission's five strategic goals. This includes investing in vibrant downtowns. Supporting, and, uh, supporting initiatives that preserve and promote the region's arts and culture, and expanding Appalachia's natural resources to increase outdoor recreation opportunities for residents and visitors, and supporting sustainable economic growth. And this is what we're gonna talk about this morning. We've invited three practitioners and policymakers to talk about Appalachia's outdoor recreational industry. I'd like to introduce, uh, first, we've got Debbie Phillips, CEO of Rural Action. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Next, we have Tammy Nazario, President and CEO of Eastern Kentucky Pride. Hi, Molly. And lastly, good morning. And lastly, Cass Rasnick, Deputy Secretary of Commerce and Trade for Rural Economic Development for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and also Director of the state's Office of Outdoor Re Recreation. Welcome, you all. Um, I'd like to ask each of the speakers to introduce themselves and tell us a little about your work. Uh, Debbie, let's start with you. Sure. Thank you so much, Molly. It's great to be here with everybody today and what a great job with the video. I'm CEO of Rural Action. We work in the Appalachian counties of Ohio and uh, we do asset-based community development in the region. Um, one of the partnerships that we've been involved with centers around trail town economic development around some of the tremendous outdoor recreation opportunities that we have here in the region. And we're delighted to be partnered in an ARC funded um, project around trail town economic development. Great. And Tammy? Let's... Hi, good morning. Thanks so much for having me. I'm Tammy Nazario, the president and CEO of Eastern Kentucky Pride. 
Um, Pride started in 1997 to, in, to improve water quality across the region. And so after all of these years, we formed, well, actually we were one of the largest grassroots movements across Eastern Kentucky with volunteerism that cleaned up the roadways and just, um, we really were proud of our communities. And so we decided it's time to bring people here. So we just launched the Kentucky Wildlands, a new regional tourism initiative across 41 counties in Southern Eastern Kentucky. And so I'm the director of that. Great, thanks, Tammy. And Cass. Good morning, go. thanks Molly and, and thanks to Debbie and Tammy for being here with us. I just love that video showcasing Southwest Virginia and, and all the assets that we have. I really appreciate y'all being here. Um, I'm Cass Rosnick, as Molly said, I serve as the governor's deputy secretary of commerce and trade for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, I, have another hat or maybe a helmet um, that is serving as our director of the Office of Outdoor Recreation. Um, offices of Outdoor Recreation are, are a bit of a growing movement in the U.S. Um, there are 18 offices now with Maryland's um, recent joining and um, and we were the 12th, I believe. We, um, we st uh, started the office in 2019 and focused on business recruitment and expansion um, and tourism promotion and coordinating our work with our state agencies. Great, thanks. So let's jump into some questions. Um, I'd like the panel to ask, I'd like to ask the panel, what have been the most effective strategies to support tourism and outdoor recreation industry in your region? Debbie, what's working in Southeast Ohio? You know, I think for us, really one of the most important things has been partnership and collaboration. If you look at the, um, the assets that we have, they don't necessarily line up around like a traditional jurisdiction, like one town or township or county. And finding ways for people to work together has been really important. The, um, the goal of developing an 88 mile mountain bike trail system on the Wayne National Forest was a dream of the Athens Bicycle Club. Um, the Wayne was interested in finding opportunities to use this asset that the community would be able to benefit from but figuring out how other local jurisdictions could be partners was complicated, right? Like how could a neighboring city or township help invest in something that's being built on national forest land? So one of the things that we had to do was get really creative and um, the partners came together to form a council of governments called the Outdoor Recreation Council of Appalachia. And that created the ability for different cities and villages um, and other units of government to be able to invest in the actual trail construction and be partners in planning and thinking about that shared branding um, and the ability to market these assets together. So how do we help bring people to the region knowing that it's gonna benefit all these different communities and all the different trail towns? So, that that partnership and getting people to think outside some of the traditional silos has been very very important uh, to the efforts here in ohio great tammy what's uh what's working in uh, eastern kentucky yeah well i would say most importantly for our project the kentucky wildlands it has definitely been community buy-in you have to have the support of your communities before you can ever move pro forward with a project of this size um, so we started with six town halls. We had over 300 people that attended. It was very important to fill the needs and get the needs of their communities. In Even in rural communities, your needs might be similar, but they're not the same. Right. And so we wanted to hear from everybody about what are your needs? What do you think would be successful as we move forward? And so we took all of those needs and the research that we did from those town halls and we put it together and that's how we built our strategic plan. And we have moved forward with that. But again, unless your community supports you, you're, you can't go forward. So that was most important. Great. And Cass, what are you, what's, what's been super successful in, in Virginia? Yeah, well, we're um, we're really blessed here to have a diversity of assets. And when I meet with some of the other outdoor recreation directors, they don't realize that um, 
that there are states that have mountains and ocean um, and, and just about everything in between. So, so we're lucky to have a real diversity of assets. But I think the, the strength that you, know, you saw in Southwest Virginia in the video and that we see in a lot of our really successful communities is that regionalism. And they, yeah. um, Southwest has, has probably got a big jump on a lot of other parts of the state in identifying the key assets without boundary lines. And so we've got 17 counties down here and they all could have said, well, this is our asset and this is the most important one. But instead the region came together, identified eight assets and really built their tourism platform around those eight assets. You know, People don't come to visit your jurisdiction to do one thing and stay within your county boundaries and spend all their tax dollars in, in one place. They really think about it as a weekend experience. And so our, our collaboration and, and those partnerships have really, um, really worked well, but it took a lot of um, taking off your county hat and putting on your kind of regional or Virginian hat to um, to prioritize. Excellent. So those are encouraging developments. Um, Tammy, uh, let's talk about the challenges. From your perspective, what are some of the difficulties that persist in the Appalachian tourism industry, um, both perhaps new challenges as well as, well as long-term systemic concerns? One of the largest challenges that we're seeing now as far as new challenges, and I think everybody can relate to this, is workforce. Mm -hmm. um, we're, our hoteliers are struggling, our restauranteurs are struggling, and I know as particularly, we developed a hospitality training program, and that was one of the things that was outlined when we went to the communities that was very needed However, we couldn't have people attend because the restauranteurs were struggling so hard um, to even have staff there. So that's been one of the main struggles. Also, I think the vastness of our region, um, building those partnerships and making sure that everybody is working together. Great. And Cass, uh, you or Debbie have comments on uh, some of the challenges in the in the industry? Um, I can definitely jump in um, and echo piece about workforce. One of the things that um, we've seen, like we really want local people to derive the economic benefit from this these, the development that's happening around these outdoor recreation assets in the region. So rather than some outside developer coming in and building something and, and being another way that wealth is extracted from the region, we're trying to figure out how to support local people to develop their own businesses. And so we've been doing things like workshops on how to Airbnb. Um, ACENET, that's part of our collaboration, provides a lot of business planning, technical assistance to businesses. We have worked with a local teacher to coordinate a high school internship program to get high school students into paid internships in some of these businesses. For some of these young people, it's the first time they've actually been like had paid work. And this can be a life changing moment for them. And these businesses then are finding really enthusiastic young people, some of whom are being hired on to help with an outfitter or an Airbnb um, and some of these different opportunities. So trying to get really creative about workforce strategies has helped us with that. That. Um, I think all of the, the challenges that the governor spoke about in the previous panel about broadband obviously mm -hmm. still is an issue. We have a lot of folks who are trying to create websites for the first time and so trying to support these very small business owners and entrepreneurs in website design, um, online access, how to connect to the state's uh, tourism office so that they're, they're benefiting from all that marketing outreach, how to connect to the websites of the assets like the trail system so that when people come to visit the trail, they might stay at a local place instead of some chain in a bigger town. And so we try to drive people kind of deeper into the community, those authentic cultural experiences that come from within our region. Um, and then, of course, the pandemic, you know, it hurt so many businesses in so many ways. For a lot of these newer businesses in the travel and tourism industry, they are uh, 
one, they could have been newer. Two, they might be seasonal. So a lot of the relief programs that were there for businesses at the very beginning of the pandemic were based on your employment in like January, February of 2020. So some of these businesses weren't eligible to get some of that financial relief as they were heading into the season and figuring out how to pivot their business model to have a safe experience for people. Um, we actually had a fantastic partnership that developed locally that included some of our local banks and local community foundations and individuals and a Facebook fundraiser to put money together to do mini grants for businesses that were just really quick. You know, if you could show that you needed it to reopen or stay open and address the changes you had to make for the pandemic, you know, we just wanted to make it really easy for the businesses that weren't qualifying for some of these other pots of money. So a lot of challenges, but a strong partnership and, you know, people who are willing to think outside those jurisdictional boundaries and figure out how to just solve problems and, and move forward. Like that's, that's how we do it in this region. That's true. <laughs> Great. Cass, I want to ask you, um, you mentioned there are 18 other states that staff outdoor recreation offices. In your work in Virginia and in interacting with these states, what are some of the emerging trends in outdoor rec and regional tourism that we should be paying attention to now um, over the next five years? Oh, can't hear you, Cass. She's muted. Yeah, so let's, Cass, we can't hear you. So I'll uh, I'll ask Tammy that question and maybe uh, you can sort out the, we'll come back to you because um, I'm, I'm very curious about your work. Tammy, what do you see in, in your crystal ball in Eastern Kentucky? Um, I see that Eastern Kentucky is poised to be the place to visit. Oh. Um, <laughs> that's what I see, um, especially, you know, after COVID, um, we are the place to social distance. We also have never been really considered a tourism destination, mm -hmm. but we are all working together as one now to lift ourselves up as a tourism destination. So I see that Southern and Eastern Kentucky has the potential to be a, a wonderful tourism destination. Great. And Debbie, what do you think, what the future hold for Southeast Kentucky, uh, Southeast Ohio? Well, for Southeastern Ohio and for all of us who are in this space of working in travel, tourism, and outdoor recreation, there's been a huge increase in the number of people who are looking for outdoor recreation opportunities. There are um, people who may be doing these things for the first time, and so they need sometimes a little higher touch um, level of service when they come to these opportunities. So um, whether those are like guided or interpretive experiences, um, access to equipment. I know our local library has um, book a bike as a program so that people can actually check out a bike and get out on the bike path or on the mountain bike trail system to try to increase accessibility. So that's something to think about. But this industry is one that's growing and a lot of the folks who are engaged in outdoor rec activities spend money when they travel. They, you know, they're, they want to do something that's healthier, that's closer to home, um, but they also want to take in some of these other um, amenities. So the other thing that um, I heard one of the governors talking about the Crooked Highway um, in Ohio, we have the winding road. And it's, you know, I think a lot of us are thinking about how do we co-brand? How do we um, help people think about a region so that when they come, they visit several different things. Maybe they go see a show, go out for dinner, um, visit a museum, um, you know, do some other things while they are there for whatever the main attraction is. So I think just kind of a, um, a more collaborative understanding that as we create these destinations in our regions and our subregions, that um, it can create more economic activity. It's not the old school kind of competitive thinking, but more like if we work together to get them here, it's going to lift all the boats. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Uh, I love the Crooked Road in, in South, uh, South, 
Southwest Virginia. It's so many crooked roads and winding roads and uh, <laughs> you're bound to get lost, but it's a great place to get lost in. Um, Cass, you're back. Can you hear us or can we hear you, I guess? Can you hear me? Yes, can we you. can hear you. Great. Okay, awesome. Well, Excellent. great. And thanks for the crooked road pitch, Molly. I'm going <laughs> to be a fiver after that. Um, yeah, there's a lot of great challenges and, and my colleagues mentioned some of them. And uh, I really think there's some some real work that um, the industry is going to focus on around sustainability and equity and inclusion. Um, there, we were um, together, the outdoor directors were together in Denver last week and we got to hear some presentations by the owner of Outside Magazine and the Outdoor Industry Association and it was all data all the time. Um, and so I was kind of taken aback by that. It was more of a kind of VC pitch than a outdoor, you know, get dirty together, you know, feel good pitch. And so it was really interesting to see that focus on um, user data and how companies are going to be thinking about that to really specialize and target um, the customers that they want. You know, we're, our office isn't focused just on tourism promotion. We're also thinking about business attraction. And so um, we know that businesses are getting specialized in their data. Um, but on, on the tourist side too, I think we have seen during the pandemic, a challenge in a lot of our best assets being loved to death. And so we've had, you know, a huge uptick in folks that are getting outside because otherwise they're just stuck in their house with their family. Um, and so they're spending more and more time outdoors but these are folks that haven't traditionally spent time outdoors, maybe didn't grow up in scouts or in another organization that taught you how to leave no trace and how to respect nature and, and be outside in a way that can sustain over the long term. Long -term. And that's going to be um, a big focus of the industry in the future and hopefully a focus of our policymakers as well is, is really thinking through how we can maintain those assets for the long term. Great. Well, so that leads to my last question, which is about balance. How do you, we've got the challenge of balancing the need to expand the economic benefits of tourism with the desires of the local residents to, to protect their sacred spaces while also being good stewards to the public lands and our natural assets. So Tammy, um, can you tell us how you're managing those competing pressures? Yes, well, um, for one, we are actually in our second year of the feasibility study for becoming Kentucky's first national heritage area. And so when that was first announced, we received a lot of calls, um, concerned citizens afraid that, you know, they may lose their land or lose their rights to their land. So it really starts with education. You do as much as you can to to educate your communities. And it really goes back to that community buy-in buy as well. Mm -hmm. Make sure that everybody in your communities know as much as they can about what you're doing. Be as transparent as you can. Let them know what your goals and your initiatives are. That's what we've found to work the most. Great. And uh, Debbie, any thoughts? Yeah, you know, we have certainly seen some of this as trails are being developed on the National Forest um, and in other communities, the people who live nearby have had that as their, their stomping grounds for generations. It's where people hunt, it's where they have their favorite patch of mushrooms or um, some of the forest medicinals or their favorite wildflower spot. And so for people who had this beautiful space that like almost nobody else was using, all of a sudden they see folks rolling in with out of state license plates and, mm -hmm. you know, coming in and having a great time and then leaving. So uh, it, it there is a real tension there. And, you know, that's part of the strategy of involving high school students in the interpretive mm -hmm. opportunities and some of the uh, tourism opportunities, um, working with the community to um, kind of provide some other amenities. So the trailhead, the main trailhead um, has had 
a new bathroom put in and some nice playground equipment and trying to find ways that we help connect the local community because we want those health benefits, the mental health benefits, all of the great things that come with outdoor recreation to be accessible for people in our communities. We don't just want to create like a playground for visitors. We, you know, we want people to come and spend money, but we also want the local community to feel ownership of these assets and the ability to use it. So the bikes that are available from the library, um, supporting people who wanna fix bikes and sell gear. Um, there are tremendous economic development opportunities connected to outdoor recreation. So yes, Airbnbs, but also manufacturing gear, you know, um, and, and lots of other associated business opportunities. So as the community starts to see real jobs and real economic development connected to it, I, that is improving. It's just, it's going to be a slow process, as Tammy said. Great. And Cass, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah I think that's, I mean, my colleagues have, have made really interesting points and we struggle with some of the th same things. I think one of the things some of our regions have done, I'm thinking of the Roanoke region, um, just north of, of here in Southwest Virginia, um, that has really focused on communicating the value proposition, not just on, okay, you've got this asset um, that you grew up around and probably thought of as paper, but we are seeing more and more businesses as well as engaged community that are using that for talent interaction and retention. And so connecting the bigger picture of, you know, this isn't just wallpaper, it's not just a fun thing to do. It can really help your community support local jobs on in a number of industries. Our hospital is using all of our outdoor recreation stuff to, to bring practitioners down to Roanoke and to spend time to say, this is not just a good place to work, it's a great place to live. And I think that goes to what Tammy was saying about community buy-in is, when folks grow up in an area, they're not thinking about, you know, the infrastructure that goes behind the trail system. They're like, no, this is my backyard. Um, it belongs to us. And so I think that's really interesting. Another thing that we're really trying to, to do is get more folks outside. And so there's, you know, when you're on the trail, you see the same folks that, you know, look like most of us. And, um, and we're really thinking about how we can get folks that have not always had access, access. And so some of those kind of mentorship programs, you want to go outside with somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, you don't want to go on a mountain bike for the first time um, by yourself. And so having, um, we've got a partnership with Big Brothers Big Sisters that is helping to sponsor some of those um, trail developments for those mentees and little little sisters and brothers um, that, that haven't traditionally been able to, or been interested in, in going outside. And so getting kids when they're young, like Debbie said, getting folks out there um, to really experience what, they're, um, what they have in their backyard is important. That's great, excellent. Um, so I know there's probably folks in the region that are watching uh, this session that might have some questions. So I'm gonna ask my colleague, Chris Hodes, if he was, uh, has any um, questions to pull those onto the screen. Okay. So the first is, do panelists see agriculture as part of the tourism industry? Um, anyone want to raise your hand and respond? Um, yeah, I, I think we see that in the region. We One other area that we've seen really deep partnership in southeastern Ohio and across central Appalachia is in like the food value chain overall. So we have a lot of um, people who take great pride in our local farmers markets and independent restaurants. Um, so that is part of that. And more people seem to be interested in where their food comes from. So some of these farms are doing tours. Some of them are um, beginning to offer either Airbnb or hip camp um, opportunities for visitors to actually stay at the farms and have that be part of their experience in visiting the region. So I think that there can be strong intersections there. And we're seeing the same thing here in our region as well, Debbie. Um, we see so many people who um, they want to see where their food comes, but they also want to educate their children now. And so a lot of the, you know, you picks are really picking up where you go pick your own. Um, and so we really see it as a great opportunity. We are actually working to build a farmer's market trail. So I, I do see it as a grand opportunity in the tourism industry. Great, excellent. 
Cassie, you wear so many hats. Is tourism, is agriculture one of them? <laughs> well, agriculture is not one of them, but tourism is. And so I think it's, you know, like my colleague said, agritourism has begun, you know, really taking off. And in Virginia, agriculture is the number one private industry and tourism is number two. So we um, spend a lot of time making sure that folks can connect those dots. Um, you know, sometimes it's as easy as having a glass of Virginia wine. Yes. Love those. Uh, all right. Any questions, Chris? Any other questions or um, are we running out of time? Okay, here's the one. Is a conflict between promoting Airbnbs and the need for affordable housing? Uh, Debbie, you mentioned Airbnbs uh, earlier in your, in your talk remarks. Um, has that come up? Um, I, don't, I don't know that we're seeing that specifically yet, but I do think that um, there are some trends at play, whether it's the short term rentals or um, people moving in to the region that can create um, the, the potential for gentrification and pricing people um, off the land and out of some of our communities. So that's something we're very concerned about and trying to think about like the pandemic really taught a lot of people um, about some of the flexibility that exists um, with respect to the possibility of remote work. So as Cassidy talked about our outdoor assets as something that can be part of an attraction strategy for getting people to move to the area who might be interested in working in, in local businesses, that also a lot of our housing and a lot of our land looks pretty darn affordable to somebody who's in New York or you know on one of the coasts somewhere. So um, we see those tensions. It's beyond just Airbnbs and, um, and affordable housing. It's also, there's tremendous opportunity for our communities to grow with people moving to the area and looking at remote work. Um, but we have to be really planful about it and careful so that people who currently live in our communities are the ones who benefit from this economic opportunity, which is why we're really trying to target those folks who already live there to think about developing these businesses because mm -hmm. we don't want to see people priced out of their communities. Absolutely. All right, and I think we have one time for one more. Measurements of success are often different between urban and rural communities. What rural specific metrics of success have been useful to you, for useful for you to, to measure performance and progress? Hmm. There's a research question for us. <laughs> uh, Cass, I'm gonna throw this one to you. If she can hear it. No? Okay. She Tammy, do you have any thoughts on how you track uh, rural measures of success? You cover a big, you know, how many, what did you say, 40 counties in eastern Kentucky? 41 counties in southern eastern Kentucky. Um, one measurement on ours um, for tourism, of course, is the statewide tourism report. You know, are your overnight visits increasing? What are, what are the dollars that are going back into your community's pockets because tourism is growing? Um, so that's one measurement that we definitely look at. We also look at, you know, are your overnight stays increasing? Are people packaging more so than what they were just day travelers? Are, um, you know, are they expanding do we have more than just two hour drivers? We, we're focusing on doing a lot of surveys right now to see, are we doing more than just two hour drivers now than what we were those folks that'll fly in and stay overnight? So those are several of the different measurements that we're looking at. Great. And Debbie, you've got sort of the town of Athens and then this big rural area. What do you think about this issue? Well, I, you know, I think that within the collaborative project that is across several counties and a couple different trail systems, we are tracking some of the same metrics, right? Businesses improved, business starts, job creation, job retention. I think that's really important, but we also appreciate ARC's um, perspective about the fact that the numbers may not look the same as in a larger urban area, right? That 
for a, a very small town or a rural area, a few jobs is a big deal, right? It, it means that it can help to anchor a community. It can help to, you know, just even having a coffee shop or a little mm -hmm. restaurant with some local food can be a big deal for a small town. So um, recognizing that the, the numbers may not be the same, but that the outcome is gonna be significant for many of our communities. And, you know, I mentioned the high school interns, you know, we had a young person who did a high school internship and when they got their stipend, they're like $500 stipend for doing, you know, a, a short, a small amount of summer work, they said, I don't ever want to be broke again, you mm -hmm. know? So some of it is those stories of like, this could change somebody's life trajectory. And that is a big deal. We had another student who did an internship at the local um, university, and they are now going. They're a first-time college, or first-generation college student because the people in that department helped them decide and figure out that they could actually apply and that this could be a path for them. So yes, the traditional metrics, but also just thinking about those individual stories that give us all kind of the emotional juice and passion to keep showing up and doing the work. Great. Yes. And Cass, I'm not sure if you're in or out. Um, it looks like uh, I, I see a spinning circle, uh, but I would agree, Debbie. Um, are you on, Cass? I'm sorry. Apologize for the technical issues. Yeah, we can't hear you. Sorry. Well, I would just concur with Debbie. Uh, transformation comes in many shapes and sizes. Uh, and I think that's one of the great things about working with ARC, you know, I'll plug uh, my uh, my agency is the the flexibility that we um, that we try to offer. Um, and and uh, so that any sort, you know, from eastern Kentucky to southeast Ohio to this Commonwealth of Virginia, what works in your area uh, can be impactful and, and, and customized for your for your area. Um, so Cass, I'm hoping you're, <laughs> I see you, but I can't hear you. Um, I wanna thank all our colleagues for participating. Um, and uh, just remind everyone that uh, we're taking a short networking break um, and then we'll have an entrepreneurial spotlight at starting at 1030. So please join some of the networking rooms. Um, the speakers will be hopefully on some of those networking tables and uh, I appreciate your, your time this morning. Thank you. Thanks so much.